Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning for those who are at home. I'm excited about Halloween. It's one of my favorite events of the year. My family has put together a trunk, which I'm not going to describe because it's amazing and it's going to be a surprise, but I'm super excited and I've heard about some of the other trunks, so you're going to want to come and check those out. Uh, but as excited as I am about that, I'm even more excited about the Word of God. I'm about diving in, absolutely. One or two can claps is perfect for this morning. <laughs> Uh, I want you guys to fill in the blank this morning. Trick or treat, smell my feet. Give me something good to eat. That's got to be the worst way to ask for candy. It is so rude. I don't even want to smell my own kids' feet, so I definitely don't want to smell some stranger's feet. Amen? I think we should change it to when a kid says trick or treat, smell my feet, we should say get your candy from across the street. That's what we should say. That teaches those boys and ghouls. How many of you have ever worn a costume before? And I'm not asking for pictures, but you've you've worn one before. All right, a few hands, a few hands. Uh, 46% of Americans will dress up for Halloween. And and how many of you do you think look as cute as this kid? Oh, that's just adorable. Adorable. 46% will dress up. 20% will dress up their pets. They will dress up their pets. And 0% of pets will enjoy it. There was a scientific study where they took some animals and they looked at their faces and they determined they don't like costumes. Here's some pictures. <laughs> yeah, that, that dog definitely does not like that. Oh, come on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's like the cone of shame, but it's like their whole body. Uh, a seven-year-old said to their dad, I want to dress up and I want to look like you for Halloween. To which the dad was flattered. He's like, oh, that's, that's amazing. Like, what, what would you wear? And he said, oh, it's easy. I would just look tired all day. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that kid got the coal of Halloween, which is candy corn cookies. Here you go. Yuck. Ew. Paul compares following Jesus to daily taking off a costume of who you should not be. Daily taking off a costume of who you should not be. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 through 25 says... Put on the new self. I want everyone to say that with me. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. So you're putting on one thing and you're taking off another. And speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Everyone say, put off falsehood. This morning, we're going to look at 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. These two young men were sent to help people put off falsehood, to take off the old self and put on the new self. All of us need to ask ourselves, what are some things we need to take off, like a Packers jersey, and things that we need to put on? Amen. Amen. So what are some things that we need to put on? So let's start off with Titus. Titus is mentioned four in four different books of the New Testament. Titus is mentioned in four different books of the New Testament. Galatians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy, and anyone want to guess what the other one is? Titus, you broke the code. Good job. You cracked the code. He's in Titus. Titus in Hebrew means pleasing. Pleasing. His name means pleasing. He was a pastor who worked in Corinth. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 talks about that. In fact, he hand-delivered the book of 2 Corinthians to that community from Paul. He was the one who brought that letter to them. So we could thank Titus for the fact that we have 2 Corinthians. Yay. He was a Gentile according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. So he wasn't Jewish, he was a Gentile. And in Titus 1.5, Paul explains why he left him in Crete. Okay? The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. All right? Crete was the legendary birthplace of the Greek god Zeus. It was a big deal in that time. It was the biggest Greek island. The Greeks believed that Zeus was a man who became God. He wasn't born a God. He was a man who became God. Paul taught that Jesus was God who became man. Zeus was notorious for lying and seducing women. 
Paul taught that God does not lie. In Titus chapter 1, very early on, he says the first characteristic about God is that God does not lie. In the ancient world, the word Carizo or Cretan, which is the people in Crete, meant liar. That was their reputation. And Paul receives this report that the Cretans or the Christians who were from Crete were acting more like Zeus than like Jesus. They were impacted more by culture than by Christ. How many of you guys have ever lied? If liar, liar, pants on fire was true, the world would have no pants. We would all be dressed like Winnie the Pooh, and that's a scary thought. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Well, we're all created in God's image. We don't all live up to that image. Unlike God, there are times where we lie. In fact, 60% of adults, 60% of adults cannot have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. 60% can't go 10 minutes without lying at least once. No wonder we have trust issues, right? Some of the, the more common lies are, I won't laugh, I promise. Or when the hostess says, your table will be ready in a couple minutes. Or I never got your text or your email. Or I have read and agreed to the terms and conditions. Oh, now all of a sudden you guys are like, every one of us should have raised my hand. I have lied before. Or the most famous one of all, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm G-double-O-D good. You lie. You lie. If you were Pinocchio, social distancing would be easy because your nose would be like six feet long. Just keep everyone away because you lie. Like the kid that told his mom that the reason why he had powdered sugar all over his face is because he was running through the house. He tripped over an item and his face landed on a donut. And that's how it happened. Yeah. Titus was left in Crete to challenge the lies, the culture of lies. In fact, he's told in Titus 1.12. One of the Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. What a terrible reputation. I would hate to be known for that. All of humanity's problems can be traced back to a lie. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 5, you will not surely die, the certain serpent says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be what like God. Here's what's said, we were already created in God's image. But the certain print comes along and lies. He says, your eyes will be open. You will see from God's perspective. We were promised open eyes, but we got eyes full of lies instead. Lies in how we see God. Lies in how we see the world. Lies in how we see one another. Lies in how we see ourselves. A common phrase these days is live your truth. Speak your truth. But if your truth doesn't align with God's truth, then it's a lie. And the world is full of lies these days. We don't create truth, we discover truth. We don't create truth, we discover truth. David prayed in Psalm chapter 119, verse 29. Keep me from your deceitful, keep me from deceitful ways, be gracious to me, and teach me your word or your law. In the New Living Translation, it says, keep me from lying to myself. Keep me from deceiving myself. We all struggle with a bias, I'm not biased bias. We all struggle with a bias of we don't have a bias bias. We overestimate our generosity. We overestimate our intelligence. We overestimate our spirituality. This is proven over and over again in scientific studies where people are asked, rate yourself. Over and over again, we rate ourselves higher than what we tend to really be. There's a bias. We are like a box of Fruit Loops. There are some things that we get right, like the loops. There are 1,700 loops in a box of Fruit Loops. Like how many gold medals Americans have won in the Olympics. But there are some things that we get wrong, like the fruit. There is no fruit in a box of Fruit Loops. 
I know, the red, the orange, the yellow, the blue cereal doesn't even taste like fruit. If you have a piece of fruit that tastes like Fruit Loops, throw it away, it's bad. <laughs> right? That's not what fruit's supposed to taste like. A person jokingly wrote, you're an adult now. Stop lying on Facebook and do it on LinkedIn. <laughs> we need to close the gap between who we want people to think we are and who we truly are. Projecting this identity that's not even real. In fact, Cindy Lauper lied to me when she said that girls just want to have fun. <laughs> I've been married for 20 years and I can tell you that that is a lie. <laughs> they want more than just fun. Preach. <laughs> so it was Titus' job to fight the lies. Titus chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, to fight the lies. John Calvin famously said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. I need to speak up, which then leads us to Timothy. So we talked about Titus a little bit, and I want to talk about Timothy because they had identical missions. If we were to think of all of Paul's ministry partners, we would name different people like Barnabas, Silas, Aquila, Priscilla, Luke, John, Mark, Apollos. But the most famous of all of Paul's partners was Timothy. Everyone say Timothy. Timothy, Timothy is mentioned in 12 books of the New Testament. So while Titus was in four, Timothy's in 12. In fact, 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. 1 Thessalonians is Paul's first letter. 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. And who does he write it to? His farewell speech is given to Timothy, but shows you something about the relationship that they had. If Timothy were a Halloween candy, he would be Reese's, Pieces, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. They have been rated the number one Halloween candy for years, and we're so again in 2022. That's just science. Do you know what the worst candy is? Nope. Circus Peanuts. Circus peanuts, but now I have a new thing to hate in this world. Circus peanuts. I always thought it was candy corn, but now I know circus peanuts is also up there. Listen to how Paul described Timothy's heart for ministry. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him. And listen to how he describes him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Paul knew a lot of people, but he's like, Timothy's one of those people who doesn't just say he cares. He has a genuine concern for other people. That should describe all of us. It was John Maxwell who famously said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Timothy cared deeply. Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Greek father, which made him a perfect candidate to be working in Crete. He was perfect to help out with the Greek culture as well as the Jewish culture. In fact, when Paul started his letters, he would often start his letters with this greeting. He would say, grace and peace to you. You guys remember that? Grace and peace to you. Grace was the traditional Greek form of greeting. Peace was the traditional Jewish form of greeting. Grace and peace to you. Here's the deal. You can't have peace without grace. You cannot have lasting peace with the people around you unless you're willing to show grace. Amen? Amen. While Titus was a leader in Crete, Timothy was a leader in Ephesus. Ephesus. We talked about Ephesus already. Listen to a couple of Paul's challenges to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia... Stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false what? Doctrines any longer. How many of you guys heard that word doctrine? You got goosebumps. You're like, yes. Nobody. Interesting. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. When you came in this morning, you were handed a sucker. Go ahead and stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Hopefully you didn't eat them already. You're handed a sucker. 
I want you to hold out your sucker. Everybody hold out their sucker. And I want you to repeat after me. I am not a sucker. sucker. You may be seated. (laughs) This is going to be the perfect reminder that you are not a sucker. Some people think that to become a Christian, you keep your brains at the door. That is not true. It is not an antithesis to have intelligence and to have faith. You can have both. I am not a sucker. One of the things that we are supposed to appreciate and love is doctrine. But here's the deal. There's no book on the New York Times bestseller list right now on doctrine. It's not like a hot topic right now. Taylor Swift just dropped a new album, and there wasn't a song on there about how much she loves doctrine. I listened. (laughs) No one tries to market their church by saying, hey, this week we're going to talk about doctrine. Bring your friends and family. Woo, yeah. In fact, the class in seminary where I was most tempted to fall asleep was our intro to doctrine class. And I'm a professional Christian. I get paid to do this stuff. (laughs) And yet the Apostle Paul writes... Watch your life and doctrine closely, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. How many of you could honestly say that you have been watching your doctrine closely? A better question. How many of you could say you know what the word doctrine really means? (laughs) The Greek word translated doctrine is didache, and it's used 140 times in the New Testament. 140 times in the New Testament. It simply means teaching, belief, philosophy of life, or worldview. Okay, we've made it more complicated. It's teaching, it's belief, it's philosophy of life, or worldview, didache, or teaching, or doctrine. So watch your doctrine closely means to watch what you believe. Watch what you adopt as your worldview, We don't always know what we believe about the end times, about abortion, about Jesus, about scripture, tattoos. We could go on and on and on in the list. We don't always know why we believe what we believe. A recent survey was conducted on the knowledge of religion and scripture. And there was a group of people who scored the highest. Do you know what that group was? Atheists. Do you know who got the lowest score? Christians. It is tragic. We inherit our ideas, we inherit our beliefs, but we don't know the why behind the what. Many think that religion is just a matter of the heart, when it is also a matter of the head. I believe it was Jesus who said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is not just a feeling thing, it is a factual thing. Many people believe that what they do because of what they heard from their parents, their pastor, their peers, their political party. Because Justin Bieber got a tattoo that says, I love Jesus, so therefore, I love Jesus too. That's a stupid reason to love Jesus. Not because they've looked into it for themselves. Not because they've done their own reading and reflecting. God warns against us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We love to surround ourselves with people who reinforce our own ideas. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 puts it this way. My people perish from lack of knowledge or doctrine. In other words, ignorance isn't bliss, it's blisters. Imagine your neighbor's house is on fire. Now a good neighbor would dial 911, but you're the hero type. So when you find out that one of their sons is trapped, you go in. You face the flames. And in the process of feeling through the dark, the roof collapses and you die a horrible death. Now what you don't know is that young Timothy, later earlier that night, had snuck out the window to go be with his girlfriend. And he wasn't even home. And you just died because of bad information. 
And now you're going to have to haunt Timothy every October 31st because of the horrible death that you just experienced. People get fired from their jobs because of bad information. Marriages dissolve because of bad information. Countries go to war because of bad information. People turn their back on God because of bad information, because it was represented in a way that was wrong. There are consequences to believe in the wrong things. It's not a light issue. Like Timothy and Titus, we are called to resist the lies and then to embrace the truth, to have a good doctrine or a good worldview or a good perspective on life. But that requires to do like Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who what? Correctly handles the word of truth. As we were driving to school early this week, my youngest asked me, Dad, why do they call kindergarten kindergarten? To which I said, that's a great question. I've never thought of that. I said, I don't know, but kindergarten sounds German to me. Let's look it up. And come to find out, it is actually, it's German. And the word kinder means kids in German. And garten means garden in German. (laughs) That was a hard one to break. Within the German culture, kids were seen as plants, and teachers were the gardeners. And the more I thought about that, the more I was like, I kind of like that analogy, because here's the deal. You can't make plants grow. You can just create an environment in which they can grow. You can't make a plant grow, but you can create an environment for them to grow. And the same thing is true with people. You can't make people grow, but you can create an environment in which they're encouraged to grow. In fact, I could build a gym And just because you walk in it doesn't mean you're going to be healthy and in shape. You have to know how to use the equipment, right? So the gym itself is not going to make you grow. And the same thing is true with a church. A church is not going to automatically make you grow. There's something that you're going to have to do. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, after 11 chapters of outstanding material, everyone considers the book of Romans to be like his best book. And after 11 chapters, listen to what Paul says. He says, in Romans 12, 2, in view of God's mercy, which is the first 11 chapters, be transformed. The most important word there is the word be. The word be. The reason why is that it's a permissive passive. For those of us who didn't do well in grammar, a permissive passive means that it doesn't happen automatically. You have to cooperate with it. In other words, he says that first 11 chapters has the ability to transform you But you've got to do something to cooperate with those chapters in order for the transformation to take place. It's not automatic. In other words, Paul's letter has the ability to transform you, but you have to cooperate. It's as if Paul is saying that the formula to transformation is a God-inspired, well-crafted, quality message plus an appropriate response from the audience equals transformation. If transformation isn't taking place, that means on one side or the other or both is not doing their job. It could be the sermon, but it could also be the people listening to the sermon. Paul says, I've just wrote these 11 chapters. They could transform you. He uses the word morphu, which is the same uh, word that's used for a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. He says, the ability is there, but you've got to do something with it. Amen. Well, Paul doesn't outline how we're to be transformed. I want to do that for us this morning. I want to suggest four things. So if you're a note taker, four things. Number one, request. And they're all going to be the letter R. Request. How many of you spent at least a half hour getting ready this morning? You combed your hair, you brushed your teeth, maybe spritzed a little bit. You did something to smell good. You got ready this morning. How many of you just rolled out of bed and you just came as is? Don't raise your hand. We already know. (laughs) How, many, how much time did you spend getting ready spiritually? We often spend a lot of time on the physical. We comb our hair, we brush our teeth. But how much time do we spend getting ready spiritually? Jesus will say seven different times in the Gospels, let him who has ears to hear, hear. In other words, there's something that you have to do to hear the message. It's not just automatic. What's going on in your heart has more to do with what you hear than what's going on with your ears. What's going on in your heart? For some of us, we don't hear, not because we have a hearing problem, but because we have a heart problem. When we come to church with our mind already made up, we're not going to hear. 
If we've already come in with, all, uh, with the kind of the idea that I know everything, we're not going to hear. Before we open the word, we have to be open to the word. We have to be ready to hear. When we come in with our mind made up, or when we come in feeling overwhelmed by guilt and shame, and we're beating ourselves the whole time, I'm the worst, I'm the worst, I don't deserve to be here, I'm going to be struck by lightning, you know, that type of stuff, you're not going to hear. When we come in angry about what someone did, like sitting in our seat, <laughs> we're not going to hear. <laughs> when we're thinking about lunch, or all the things that we forgot to do for the Halloween event, we're not going to hear because we're distracted. We can't hear what God is trying to say through the sermon, and we need to pray every Sunday before we come in, God, I want to hear or experience what you want me to experience. I want to participate, or as David said in Psalm 119, he said, open my eyes to see the wonderful things in your word. Help me to be responsive. Number two, remember. Remember. A woman had a habit of sitting in the back when whenever the minister would get done, she would tell him how great he had done. Oh, it's another home run, Pastor. It's another home run. And so one Sunday he decided to ask her specifically, what did you like about the sermon? What did you like about the message? And she kind of drew a blank and, and, uh, and she kind of shuffled her feet a little bit. And then she said, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but Reverend, I'm a lot more like a wicker basket than a bucket. When you dip me in the well, I get wet, but I don't retain any of the water. In other words, she enjoyed the experience, but she didn't know why she enjoyed the experience. She didn't retain the information. On average, only 10% of what people hear in a sermon is remembered the next day. 10% within one day is all that is remembered. That's depressing to me. It's job security, but it's depressing. <laughs> you know? I mean, if we had 100% retention and we'd only have like a month of sermons, then you guys would be like, all right, I got it all down. But only 10, and that's within 24 hours. Imagine what it is by the next week, by the next Sunday. This is why taking notes is so important. This is why we put the papers out so that you have the opportunity to write things down because now you're helping to reinforce that information. You can go look back at it or the fact that it's online and you can see it forever. Number three, reflect. Reflect. How often do we talk about the sermon after the sermon? If we were to eavesdrop on your conversations in the car ride home or when we're at lunch, how often do you talk about the sermon? And I'm not talking about you know silly things like Pastor Dan's shoes or I didn't like that joke or that you know like the important stuff like what do I need to change about my attitude? What do I need to change about my actions? What do I need to do in response to that sermon? How often do we talk about those types of things? What do I need to do about it? Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character, I want to say noble character, than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness, so there's not only just an excitement, that's the eagerness, and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They fact-checked the Apostle Paul. The attitude of many of the Thessalonians was just to reject Paul outright. We don't like what you're talking about. You're not very funny. You're bringing up subjects that makes us uncomfortable. We reject you. But it says the Bereans were of more noble character because they went home every day to look at the scriptures for themselves to see, is what Paul is saying factual? Is it truthful? Is it useful? Every pastor, no matter how educated or experienced, should be fact-checked. Self-included. We should be going home and we should be looking at the scriptures for ourselves. I remember sharing one time about various people's life verse. Have you ever heard of like a life verse? Different ones have kind of like a life verse. And I was sharing some different ones, some famous ones. And then I shared one of them that a friend of mine in college, it was a girl, uh, her life verse. And I shared it with him and I said it was Psalm 56.1. Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. And she said that that was her life verse taking it a little bit differently than David intended. Uh, but when I quoted the verse, I said the wrong chapter in verse. Those girls went home and they spent hours trying to find it and called me up and they called me and they're like, Pastor Dan, we like that verse, but we don't know where to find it. I wish all of us would go home and do our homework and search the scriptures for ourselves and to see if what is being said is truthful and beneficial. Number four, respond, respond. A sermon is like a stop sign. It doesn't matter if you properly interpret it if you don't obey it. 
It doesn't matter that you understand that a stop sign means stop if you just roll right through. You need to do something with the information. A gentleman slowed down at a stop sign, and he did what is referred to as a no-cop stop. Does anybody know what a no-cop stop is? It's where you just roll on through. You know, you roll on through. So he just rolls on through, and unfortunately for him, there was a cop. And the cop pulls him over. And the policeman says, do you know why it is that I stopped you, or why I pulled you over? And he says, no, I have no idea. He says, well, you rolled through the stop sign rather than stop. He says, no, 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 I stopped. He says, well, the camera on my car would say otherwise. You rolled through rather than stopping. He says, well, what's the difference between slowing down and stopping? The police officer, feeling a little mischievous, took his baton, began to hit him on the head and says, do you want me to slow down or stop? The first goal of listening to a sermon is to correctly understand what is being said in the message. What does this mean? But the second question to ask is, how should I respond to this? What is the response that God is trying to get me to take action on? It does no good to know that it means stop and then not stop. Unfortunately, this is precisely how many people treat sermons, which is why there's this repeated theme throughout Scripture, and I want to read it for you. James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Listen to these four words, do what it says. These are probably the most four important words in the Bible. Do what it says, because if you're not doing that, the rest of it means nothing. Do what it says. All the 600 plus promises, all the 600 plus commands, do you no good if you do not do what it says. Ronald Reagan once told a story about a psychiatrist. Each day, they would show up, and they'd be well-dressed and alert. But at the end of the day, the younger doctor was frazzled and disheveled, and the older was always fresh and ready to have a, a, a good evening. And the younger one asked him, said, how do you do it? How do you listen to all these problems, all these challenges, and walk out looking fresh day after day after day? You always stay so fresh and so calm. The older doctor replied, it's easy. I just don't listen. And I believe one of the reasons why so many of us walk out no different than when we came in is because we don't listen. We hear in an entertaining sort of way, but we don't listen with the heart of the Spirit, which say, all right, God, what are you trying to say to me this morning? What is it that I need to change about my attitude or my actions or my life? What is it that I'm not doing that I need to do better? Do what it says the word disciple appears 230, 269 times in the Bible. 269 times the word disciple appears. Do you know how many times the word Christian appears? Three. We were never called to just be Christians. We were called to be disciples. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. But what is a disciple? The word disciple comes from the Greek word mathetes, which is where we get the word math. And don't start sweating. We're not going to talk about algebra and trigonometry. It means to be a student. A student. Rabbis had disciples. Philosophers had disciples. Moses had Joshua. Elijah had Elisha. Mordecai had Esther. Paul had Timothy and Titus and anyone else who was willing to kick the darkness and make it bleed light. Disciples. But this word student isn't beefy enough. It doesn't really explain what it means. Jesus didn't come for students, he came for servants. People who are willing to do what it is that's being asked. He didn't come to just change IQs, he came to change IDs, our character. He didn't come because we needed an education, he came because we needed transformation and salvation. Luke 6.40, everyone when he is fully taught will be like his teacher. All of us have teachers. We might not know exactly who they are, but we have people who are shaping our worldview, are shaping our ideas, and they are who we are becoming like. And the goal of discipleship is to be like Jesus. And yet George Gallup claims, after lots of research, that only 10% of Christians take discipleship seriously. Only 10%, which is why the church looks the way it does. Only 10% take discipleship seriously. Someone said recently, you know we have that saying, Jesus, take the wheel. Someone said recently, Jesus doesn't need to take the wheel. He needs to pull over and spank some of us with his slipper <laughs> or his sandal. The church desperately needs to stand for truth. 
but that requires knowing truth. And I want us to keep that in mind as we read through 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus this week, is to be praying, all right, God, where do I need to stand up for truth? And where do I need to do a better job of knowing doctrine, knowing what it is that I'm supposed to believe and how I'm supposed to behave?